Very strong language now as BBC Two Scotland traces the early origins of the Scots language from its roots through to its heyday as the language of kings. Carl MacDougall changes perceptions of our native tongue. For generations, the Scots language has been denigrated as nothing more than bad English, the bastard offspring of a superior tongue, fit only for low comedy and sentimental poetry. So let's get one thing straight right from the start. Scots is magnificent, muscular and versatile and deserving of a far greater status and recognition than it currently enjoys. In this series, I'm going to explore the amazing history of the mother tongue from its multicultural origins through its golden age to its fall from grace, arguing that the language of kings should once again be at the heart of national life. But there's still a lot of confusion about the status of Scots, accent, dialect, or language. Do you think Scots is a language? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. yeah. What language do you speak? I speak English. English. I would argue it's more of a dialect. Um, I don't really see enough of a difference between it and general English. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about the argument that Scots is a language? Scots is a language? You're talking about the Gaelic or just a dialect? I'm talking about Scots. Scots dialect. Do you think it's a dialect? Yeah, I would put it down as a dialect. Still, it's a different language. Yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's more difficult to, to, because we in Holland learn typically English or American. Yeah. And Scottish, it's, yeah, pronunciation, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, I think we speak our own right. tongue. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do. Are you proud of the way you speak? Yes. We get our Scots out among our friends and family, but when it comes to the public domain, it's English that comes out our mouths. But Scots is not just a language for blethering. It's an all-purpose Rolls-Royce of tongues, capable of expressing the profoundest philosophical thought, the most soaring emotion, and the deepest political sentiment. The Scots language has carried our culture down the centuries. Its words and sounds echo who we are. Sweet floweret, pledge o' meek a love, and ward o' mony a prayer. What heart a stain would thou na move, so helpless, sweet and fair? November herpels o'er the lee, chill on thy lovely form, and gain alas the sheltering tree, should shield thee frae the storm. Scots does matter today in the sense that it's always mattered because it's part of who we are and part of how we express ourselves. The range of Scots includes the word of God and the language of the Bible. In the beginning are our things, the word was their ends, and the word bade with God, and the word was God. He was with God at the beginning, and our things came to be through him. From the sacred to the secular, our language has been entertaining us and making us laugh for generations. She has come, she has come, you like a cup of tea out of and Fair enough, you might get an empty wash cab as a biscuit, but it's a It is the language that Scots invented to talk about their cells. It is the only language that talks about Scotland. There can be no doubt that, like any language, Scots conveys a vast and complex array of thoughts and feelings, but it does more than that. Speakers and listeners are bound together in a sense of community and identity. <laughs> Your language comes right out from inside you. It's, it's your voice, it's who you are, it's where you're comfy, it's what you are. And whenever somebody says, that's not good enough, then they're basically they're saying, you're not good enough. You certainly, you cannot be proud of who you are if you can't be proud of how you speak. The establishment in this country considered it a disadvantage 
if you spoke that language, you had to speak proper English. Academically, it was required of you, etc., 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 etc. And they used to belt you if you if you if you use the words that you use in everyday language in the streets and in your homes. That's almost that's a form of linguistic fascism. Johnny Wilson's born in Bali. Centuries of neglect have seen the Scots language degraded and pushed aside. It's still at the heart of folk song, but outside this tradition, we speak less surely. If as soon as we open our mouths, we are told not to speak or to say something differently, all the time that eradicates how you feel, it erodes how you feel about yourself and your confidence slips until you either learn not to say very much or you learn to speak in another voice. If we lack confidence in the way we speak or feel uncomfortable with the status of our own tongue, this has everything to do with our relationship with English. The question about whether Scots is a separate language from English has always been a controversial and tricky question. They are mutually intelligible languages uh, in the way that Spanish is mutually intelligible with Portuguese or Danish and Norwegian are mutually intelligible. Scots and English have a common ancestor in Anglo-Saxon but partly because of simply the fact that the two dialects naturally developed separately and diverged, partly also because of the foreign influences on both languages, different separate foreign influences on both languages, Scots and English developed separately and are now two separate languages. If most of us are ignorant of our linguistic ancestry, then the words we use can remind us of our origins because language carries the imprint of the folk who spoke it in the past. Take some words we all know. I, Loch and Bray, for example, come from Gaelic, which at one time was the dominant language throughout Scotland. Now take Kirk, Ken, Hoos, Stain, all words that can be traced back to the Germanic tribes who settled here. Then there are words like foo from Scandinavia, flower from France and gadji from India, all brought here by successive waves of settlers who added to the language. So Scots is a great mixter maxter tongue, but to understand how it came about, we we'll have to go back to a time before Scotland existed as a nation. 2,000 years ago, Southern Britain was part of the Roman Empire. To the north lived the ancient Caledonians, a Celtic people known today as the Picts. The Pictish language was never written down. We've got the names of some kings and we've got the names of some individual heroes. We've got some place names in Pictish, but we haven't got any continuous texts in Pictish as we have in Old Irish or Old English. So there's a lot that's not known for certain about the language of the Picts. The place names of Scotland provide a great clue to the history of the language, and the map is a perfect tool to help unravel the early history of Scots. For example, to find traces of the Pictish people, look for places with pit in them, like Pitlochry or Pit and Weem. Then there's Perth, which means a wooded area. The Picts were a fiercely independent people, but their culture and language were destroyed after the Roman Empire collapsed in the fourth century. Britain was then flooded by invading tribes from across the seas, among them the Angles and the Saxons, who came from what is now northern Germany. The Anglians um, moved north uh, across uh, the, the, the British, British Isles uh, and in the 7th century entered what is now modern-day Scotland. And it's from Anglian, this variety of Anglo-Saxon, uh, that um, the first input to Scots comes. Um, and that's the relationship between Scots and Anglo-Saxon. No one really knows what Anglo-Saxon would have sounded like, but a few written examples and fragments can provide some clues. And because some of the words are like our own, we can assume many of the sounds would probably have been the same. <laughs> Uh, 
Because Scots and English are derived from the same linguistic root, it's wrong to argue that Scots is just another form of English. Because many words are similar doesn't mean that one pronunciation is correct and the other a corruption. Scots and English started probably from the same root. I mean, nobody can be sure where language really begins. English is also a dialect derived from that same source, right? It would be just as easy to say English is a dialect of Scots as it is to say Scots is a dialect of English. Words like stain and hem uh, really come from Old English words like stan, ham, moose, hoose. Moose and hoose have hardly changed their pronunciation since the beginning of uh, Anglo-Saxon in Britain. And so they're not really corruptions of English, they're really developments uh, which have happened to Scots uh, in a different way. The Germanic Angle spread rapidly north and began to settle along the border, leaving their mark on the towns and villages. Places like Selkirk, which means the Kirk in the Forest, Hoyk, Jedburgh or Birkenside, which means the Hill of the Birches. But as the Angles moved north into the Lothians, they met another powerful group of people who spoke a completely different language, Gallic speakers from the west. Known to the Romans as the Scotti, this Celtic tribe crossed from Ireland in the 5th century and settled Scotland's west coast. Gaelic has given us a wealth of words to describe the landscape. Bray, Loch, Ben, Firth, Glen and Corrie are just a few. Bala for village and Achad for field turn up in place names like Balnagowan and Alchin Lake. Gaelic was spoken in Scotland before Anglo-Saxon was. Gaelic was originally the language of the Scottish monarchy. Gaelic was the language of the Kingdom of Scots. The Scots, who originally came from Ireland, united with the Picts. And this Kingdom of the Picts and the Scots had Gaelic as its main language. In the fight for land, the Gaels were forced to retreat along with their language. The city behind me, of course, is Edinburgh, but until 640, it was known as Dun Eden, the Celtic for the hill fort of Eden. After the fortress was lost to the invading Angles, it became known as Edinburgh, or Edensburg, Burg being the Germanic word for fortified hill. Invasion and colonization was a feature of Scottish life during the turbulent years known as the Dark Ages. While bloodletting and colonisation was going on in the south of Scotland, the far north experienced wave upon wave of invasion and settlement from Scandinavia. By the 8th century, the Pictish languages of Orkney and Shetland had been replaced by the voice of the Viking. Old Norse was the language of the Vikings. Scotland, like England and all Western Europe, was subject to Viking raids and Viking settlements. The Northern Isles, still the dialect of Orkney and Shetland, is permeated with Norse words. Place names in the north also remind us of this Viking past. Kirkwall, Church on the Bay, Thurzo, the river of the thunder god Thor, and then a host of everyday words we still use in Scots like midden, lug and quine. The impact of Norse on Scots is, um, is, is very profound. Some people like to think of, of the families of languages as being, of languages being like a family. Uh, you have an ancestor language and then it descends um, uh, down in like a family tree. Um, perhaps a better way of thinking about it is rather like a river, um, whereby various tributaries come into the language to produce what, what ultimately um, come, comes out. 300 years after the first Viking raids, the next major influence to flow into this linguistic river came from the south. After the Norman invasion of England in 1066, continental influences began to make their way to Scotland. French-speaking fortune hunters and barons on the make brought their language into the mix, along with Latin, the language of the Roman Catholic Church, and the medium of scholarship and learning. For the next two centuries, Scotland and England enjoyed a period of relative peace and stability, but it couldn't last. Facing domination by the English, Scotland's struggle for independence culminated in the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. This defining moment in Scotland's history was celebrated in verse. <laughs> 
John Barber's Bruce is the earliest known work of Scottish literature and was written a generation after the Battle of Bannockburn. It's a patriotic epic which tells the story of Bruce's heroic victory and is best known for its opening definition of freedom. Ah, freedom is a nobler thing. Freedom makes man to hith liking. Freedom all solace to man give us. He liveth at ease that freely liveth. The Bruce is really the first example that we've got of an extended poem in Scots. And it shows that Scots, then the vernacular can be used to produce a piece of epic writing. So that was a very important cultural moment for Scotland. So here for the first time you've got a vernacular romance epic and it's not based in some distant country, it's based on something profoundly Scottish, a Scottish national hero. And it's written presupposing an audience that is going to be reading Scots as well as speaking Scots. John Barber is a literary equivalent of Chaucer, and like his English contemporary, Barber also drew on a wider European tradition. French influences were very important on, on Barber. Although he sees his, his work as having a historical base, he talks about it as a romance, um, the word itself coming from French. Amid the patriotic fervour of the Bruce, it's easy to forget that the name Bruce is actually French. But of greater significance is the politics of the time, and the dictum, my enemy's enemy is my friend, was just as true in the 13th century as it is today. So for Scotland and the struggle to maintain independence from England, this meant ever closer union with France. The French connection was formalised by the Old Alliance. This military treaty established in 1295 allied France and Scotland in a pact against England. It uh, worked both sides, especially during what is called the Hundred Years' War, when France was invaded by the English and the Scots came to help the French. The alliance between France and Scotland underlined and strengthened ties that had already existed for hundreds of years. The Bruce family came from Brix in Normandy. The Stuart family came from Dol in Brittany. All these big Scottish families had French origin. During the 14th and 15th centuries, Scotland was head over heels in love with everything French. French culture exerted a huge influence on what we did in Scotland. Our students came and studied here. Our writers and artists emulated the French style. Our royalty ate French manners and even commissioned French-style palaces to live in. Not surprisingly, claret became our national drink. A votre santé. French, of course, was the, the language of the aristocracy. What people did was to take French and use that as a, as a cultural marker. I'm an important person, um, I'm using French uh, words. Even if I'm naturally uh, a vernacular user, I'll stud my language with French to make it have that desirable look. But the French influence on Scots society reached from the very top to the bottom. The wifeys in the Edinburgh Old Town used to empty their morning chanties with a cry of Garde Lou, watch the water. And this was the time where what we now recognise as Gid Scots words like ashit, jigget and tassie, which is derived from the French for cup, came into the language. Throughout the Middle Ages, French culture continued to be influential, but by the 15th century, things were changing. Like other emerging nation states across Europe, Scotland began to assert its own identity, using Scots to express this new patriotism. At the beginning of the 15th century, you've got the birth of a distinctive literature in the Scots language. People like James I is writing poetry in Scots, you've got people translating French chivalric treatises into Scots. So you're getting this beginnings of a literature in Scots that is the beginning of a flowering of a literature in the Scots language that is the equal of any in Europe. No figure in Scottish history better symbolises the nation's struggle for independence than William Wallace, eulogised by Blind Harry in his epic poem. <laughs> 
The Englishman semblet on Wallace there, feel on the field of Frechus, fecht and fast. He, an abyssit, and knocked greatly aghast. Upon the head, aim with the sting, hit he, till bane and brain he gart in pieces flee. Gory stuff, but it's claimed that Blind Harry's poem was one of the most popular books ever printed in Scotland, perhaps because it celebrated the struggle of the common man for national freedom. I think its original popularity may have had a lot to do with this element of nationalism. The poem talks a lot about blood, about blood, um, from the point of view of, of Wallace almost kind of feeding on Southern blood. It doesn't focus exclusively on a kingly figure. It focuses also on somebody from a lesser background who represents the kind of spirit of freedom and nationhood. And in that respect, may have offered to readers a stronger object of identification. By the time James IV came to the throne in 1488, the Scots language was rich and diverse, the equal of any European language. We had poems, plays, satires and epics in the classical mode. This was the golden age. By the time you get to the end of the 15th century, you've got a much more dynamic, a much more expressive literature in Scotland than you have it in contemporary England of the time, and certainly it ranks alongside any of the literatures of continental Europe. Scots had developed into the most wonderfully versatile language, but amazingly it was still generally known as English, I-N-G-L-I-S. Nowadays our ideas of language are inextricably bound to ideas of nationhood, but 500 years ago there wasn't such a strong link. It just does not seem to have struck people that um, seems to have struck anybody, either writers, politicians or anybody, that the language was one of the things that made Scotland individual and distinctive. The idea that our Scottish identity inheres to a very large extent in the presence of the Scots language, this is a modern idea. The first significant person to use the term Scots was Gavin Douglas. Having lived in England and Scotland, he understood the difference and made this point forcibly when he translated Virgil's Aeneid from the original Latin into Scots. And yet, forsooth, I set my busy pain as that I sued to make it braid and plain. So me behoove it willem, or then be dumb, some bastard Latin, French or English ois, war scant war Scottish I had na uth a choice. Douglas has a, a more developed, if you like, sense of the use of Scots, and he talks about what he's actually doing as a translator. He says that there are occasions when he's translating Virgil when Scots is scant, and therefore he needs to draw words out of Latin and French and put them into Scots in order to enrich the language. Douglas talks about wanting a fouth of language, like a kind of a rich flowing quantity of, of, of language. That's the effect that he's trying to create. He talks about Scots as if it is a language very distinct from English. And I think he does this for a number of reasons. One of them is that he realizes the importance of language for a sense of national identity. And he says, the English have their language, the Scots have their language and we can, we can translate the greatest literature in Europe and we can translate it into Scots. Our most versatile and talented exponent of the language during this golden age was William Dunbar. Born in East Lothian, he was an international diplomat and poet at the court of King James. William de Mar's poetry was written more than 500 years ago, yet when we say it aloud rather than read it, we understand the language perfectly today. When that the nicht does lengthen o'er us, with wind, with hail and heavy sureus, my dool a spreet does lurk for shoyer, my heart for langur does for lawyer, for lack of summer with his flourus. Dunbar, he is very, very much a, seen as an iconic figure of the brilliant, flourishing court of James IV 
James IV's reign is often seen as the high watermark of Scotland's great late medieval and renaissance period with the brilliant king as its centre. By the time you get to William Dunbar at the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, uh, you've got a work that can express all sorts of emotions, ideas in Scots. You've got the poetry of religious celebration. You've got the poetry of courtly satire. You've got the poetry of rustic comedy. The thing about Dunbar's poetry is you can do anything with it. He takes from the full range of linguistic resources that's available to him. He takes from Latin, he takes from French, he takes from Old Norse, he takes from Anglo-Saxon, he takes everything that's available and he uses it in a whole range of styles. He's the greatest stylist that Scottish literature has produced. Although Dunbar's poetry uses the Scots spoken by the king, his range includes the body and the obscene. This occurs in a poetic slagging match known as Flighton, where Dunbar is credited with the first use of the F word for literary effect. This is a flighting between two very important early 16th century poets, William Dunbar, who is one of the great mackers of the Scots tradition, and Walter Kennedy, a slightly less well-known Scottish poet of this era. Kennedy frequently refers to Dunbar as a dwarf, and a dirty dwarf as well, but he calls him uh, a mandrake mimikin, and Mimikin is kind of a, a little deformed person. He is known to have explosive bouts of diarrhoea to, to the extent that on one occasion when he's on a sea journey back from France, um, he covers the entire ship with diarrhoea and vomit. So, so that, that gives you some of the kind of flavour of it. Um, flavour's perhaps not the right flavor's choice. Flavour's probably not the right <laughs> yeah, choice of word. It gives you some of the sense yeah, of Yeah, but it. I have an idea of what's been suggested. Yeah, there. Dunbar is probably even ruder about Kennedy, particularly about Kennedy's sexual history. Um, he says that Kennedy is cunt-bitten. Right. Um, Kennedy says that Dunbar is one fuck it. You know, yes. he's kind of misgenerated, yes. right? Um, but Cuntbitten is obviously particularly rude. Some of the best examples come at the ends of each of the flightings, when each poet builds up to a crescendo of cumulative abuse, which is also recapitulatory in its nature. Four flitten, cunt bitten, bishitten, bark it hide, clean leather, file tedder, foal edder, I defy thee. I defy thee. <laughs> <laughs> Four flitten is very good because it means you've been outflighted. Yeah, yeah. It's showing you, if you like, the kind of amazing capacity of Scots. It's like a kind of celebration of what you can do with yeah. Scots. And Dunbar was one of the earliest poets really to do this and to show that fantastic versatility. How true would it be to suggest even that Dunbar was the originator of a tradition that we find in Scottish writing? I think it would be fair to say that, actually, yeah. and I think it's one that goes right down to Irvin Welsh yeah. in train spotting. Yeah. That ability to move between registers and styles and ways of saying things within one scene, um, which Dunbar does so eloquently, mm -hmm. to me that seems very distinctive in the Scottish mm -hmm. tradition. Dunbar's poetry demonstrates a richness and vitality that speaks directly across the ages in a Scottish voice we recognise as our own. The 14th and 15th centuries showed the fantastic potential for the Scots tongue. It was the language of court, of legislation, and some of the finest European poetry. But within a generation, events conspired to bring the language of kings to the brink of extinction. Carl McDougall discovers how history dealt a series of near-fatal blows to the Scots language next Tuesday at 10.